Mankind is peering ever deeper into the cosmos. But should we succeed in our quest to completely explain the world using the laws of nature, what room is left for faith? In the beginning, God said, let there be light, according to the Bible. So is our universe the result of a creation event? Or did it simply come into being from nothing? In the beginning, there was God, says the church. No, in the beginning was the Big Bang, says science. So, which is right? Well, there are four possibilities. Either the church is right, or science is right. Or they're both wrong. Neither is right. But it's also possible that both are right. Because these apparently contradictory positions don't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive. Since the beginning, the church has always had a close relationship with astronomy and cosmology. In the year 1225, the English theologian Robert Grostest publishes a revolutionary theory. The universe came into being when God created a tiny point of light. It expanded in all directions, pulling the simultaneously created matter with it. It's basically the Big Bang, as described by Grostest, who would later become Bishop of Lincoln, a man of religion. The 13th century clergyman theorized and conducted research using the tools of physics of the time, supplemented by his own observations. He based his ideas on the natural philosophy of Aristotle, perhaps the greatest thinker in ancient Greece. Grostest investigated the phenomena of motion, time, and light. He outlined his concept of a Big Bang 700 years before the Big Bang theory came to define modern-day astronomy. While the similarity is quite striking, it should be taken with a pinch of salt. It was a completely different era than today. His ideas weren't founded on modern-day cosmology. He was most likely inspired by Aristotelian physics. This states that there's initially a point of light in the center, which he called lux, and this spreads outward, forming the concentric spheres, and is then reflected inward but as lumen, created light, which then basically creates the matter. Grostest attempted to explain the world using ancient knowledge and physical laws. Grossetest also alluded to conducting experiments and making careful observations of natural events. This generated new insights. He drew on these new insights to reinterpret the Bible. And the end result was a thoroughly satisfying interpretation for the time. His model of an Earth surrounded by celestial spheres corresponded to the generally accepted worldview. The church believed in a God up in heaven who looked down on mankind. The earth was at the center, with the sun and all the other heavenly bodies moving around it. By the end of the 12th century, the writings of the Greek natural philosophers were just being rediscovered, and attempts were being made to reconcile their teachings with the Christian faith. The original motivation was to open people's eyes to the beauty and orderliness of nature and investigate it for the glory of God, as it were. When you read the introduction to Kepler's works, for example, he always begins with a laudation of the Creator and then comes to the thing he actually wanted to say. The modern Big Bang theory was developed in the 20th century. Georges Lemaitre is considered its father. He too was a man of the church, a priest, and astrophysicist. In 1927, he published his theory of the origin of the universe, the simultaneous creation of space, time, and matter. The astronomer Edwin Hubble confirmed Lemaitre's controversial idea through his observation that the universe was expanding. The Big Bang theory is revolutionary. 
But when Pope Pius XII wanted to use it as confirmation of the Catholic creation doctrine, Le Maitre resisted. The priest kept his science strictly separate from his faith. I'm sure that if we asked Le Maitre today whether or not being a Catholic priest influenced his research, he would say no. He was simply an astrophysicist or scientist in this context. And as far as I can tell, he always kept his theology out of this work. I must never allow my faith to be tied to a scientific theory. Faith and science are two different areas of inquiry. Nevertheless, the Big Bang theory and creation doctrine just fit together too well. And so in 2014, Pope Francis declared that the Big Bang, as the beginning of the universe, requires a divine creator. I believe the Big Bang is perfectly compatible with faith, religion and God, because all that scientists can say about what came before the Big Bang is, we can't really describe it. We not only lack the scientific knowledge, but the capacity to explain it scientifically. And that, ultimately, is something religion does. Religion attempts to describe something we have no answer for by invoking a god, such as the question of what happens after we die. Was the universe created from nothing? According to the book of Genesis, which describes how everything began for the Jewish and Christian faiths, it did. An omnipotent God created the universe ex nihilo. This corresponds with the prevailing opinion among cosmologists, too. The Big Bang marks the creation of the universe from nothing, the beginning of everything. Everything had a beginning. But what does this mean exactly? Well, the church interprets it like this. God created the world in his divine timelessness. They call it aeternitas. But this gives rise to a logical problem. Why did he create the world at precisely one particular moment, and not earlier or later? This problem had already been identified by the early church father, Augustine, in 400 AD. He pondered the matter and came to the conclusion that when God created the world, he simultaneously created time. And so the problem was resolved. There's one moment of creation, and this marks the beginning of time. And interestingly, modern science shares the exact same opinion. According to Einstein's general theory of relativity, space and time were created at the moment of the Big Bang. Ever since human beings first turned their gaze to the sky, they've sought to unlock its secrets and use the observable cycles for their benefit. During the Neolithic, around 7,000 years ago, a so-called rondel was constructed not far from the present-day town of Gozik in Saxony-Anhalt in Germany. The prehistoric structure provides evidence of early astronomy. The Neolithic represents a watershed moment in human history. It was a period when people started settling down and adopting a farming culture. The position of the sun over the course of the year now governed the rhythm of life between sowing and harvesting. You have to realize that from around 6,500 before Christ, the most significant change in human history began, namely the so-called Neolithic Revolution. The transition from hunting and gathering to farming and animal husbandry to a settled way of life, where people were completely at the mercy of local environmental conditions. And this dependency, the fact that they now stayed in one place, naturally led to their religious beliefs, adapting accordingly. Rondels were built in many regions of Central Europe, and they still hold mysteries for researchers. Scientists debate their exact purpose to this day. What's remarkable about the Gozek Circle is its precise astronomical alignment. Two of the three openings in the Ring Palisade mark the sunrise and sunset on the day of the winter solstice. This dependence on nature gave rise to new rites. 
The Gozek circle may thus have served as a method for determining the position of the sun combined with ritual worship. I see the roundels as an architectural expression of a worldview people had back then. And in building them, they created a sanctuary against their surroundings and the natural environment in which they lived and were dependent on. Und dem Naturraum, in dem man lebte und von dem man abhängig war, etwas entgegensetzen wollte. And it seems to me that these passages between inside and outside, the sacred inner sanctuary and the secular outside world represent the key significance of these structures. Since time immemorial, humans have been fascinated by celestial phenomena. Observers couldn't fail to notice the periodicity of the heavenly bodies. The life of many early civilizations was governed by the seasonal changes of the sun. Observation of the movement of the celestial bodies gave rise to new cults and religious interpretations. And celestial phenomena were used to predict coming events. The sky was sacred. It was home to deities and a source of divination for all faith-based cultures. Terrestrial life was dictated by the cosmic order. The stars served as signposts. Those who possessed knowledge of the sky and its phenomena knew the exact time of the year and thus the dates important for farming. Observation of the stars thus served to legitimize the power of rulers and priests. They governed the course of life on Earth. The Nebra sky disk was also a symbol of power. The bronze disk was made around 1800 BC and depicts what is probably the oldest specific representation of astronomical phenomena in the world. As time went by, the sky disk was further embellished or modified. The original picture was probably a very dark, almost pitch black disc with 32 stars, with the sun and crescent moon or full moon and crescent moon, and a cluster of seven stars that presumably represent the Pleiades. The Pleiades are of course navigation stars, calendar stars, orientation stars. Pleiades is a very conspicuous constellation that rises and sets and thus tells us something about the passage of time. The Pleiades vanish from the central European night sky in March and reappear in October, accompanied by a crescent moon in spring and a full moon in fall. They denote the agricultural year. Two horizon arcs were added later, as well as a ship at the bottom that's sailing across the ocean of the sky. And what all this tells us is that it's encoded an aide-memoir, a leap rule for constructing a lunisolar calendar. And they had it in the Bronze Age over 3,600 years ago. We never expected this. It was a stunning discovery. A lunisolar calendar, or combined lunar-solar calendar, is based on the phases of the moon. But in order to approximate the solar year, Every three years on average, a leap month, that is, a 13th month, is added. Combining the lunar calendar with the solar phases allows the seasons that govern religious and farming life to be harmonized. The fact that you could link the sun and moon to create a perfect lunisolar calendar was quite a discovery back then. It was a bit like having control over time. The Nebra sky disk still holds many mysteries. The various phases that the Bronze Age disk went through suggest that its function and status changed over time. So it probably served different purposes at different times thereby evolving from astronomical instrument to cult object. As a tool of knowledge, the sky disk has become an instrument of mythology, religion and religious interpretation. But one thing the sky disk has always been is a symbol of power, whether visible to all as it is now, or concealed from view as it was at the beginning. Toward the end, the sky disk was probably just a symbol, perhaps part of a standard. Roughly punched holes for attaching it to something 
attest to its diminished value. Ultimately, this symbol of power was buried along with swords, axes, and golden arm rings. In all ancient, advanced civilizations, primitive states, early, complex societies, and this was a complex early Bronze Age society in Central Europe, heaven and the authority granted by heaven and the gods served as a justification for the rulers. The rulers had to come up with a reason why they were so much more powerful and wealthy than everyone else. Because human beings aren't innately predisposed to, or historically accepting of the idea that there should be rich and poor, powerful and weak. From prehistoric to modern times, observation of the celestial bodies has governed the passage of time. The apparent motion of the sun, the change from day to night, and the seasons dictate the day-to-day -day life of human beings. Religion and farming are informed by and closely linked through our knowledge of calendar events and understanding of celestial mechanics. Incidentally, the ancient Babylonians, Egyptians and Greeks were quite outstanding astronomers, or rather stargazers. And it's clear why. They had nothing better to do with their evenings than drink wine and contemplate the heavens. And they noticed that not all of the stars were fixed. Some of them moved. How could that be? They called these stars wandering stars. Today, we call them planets. And they attempted to explain what was going on. They proposed, and Aristotle said quite explicitly, that there's a creator up there, a so-called unmoved mover. He causes the planets to move. And like a clock movement, these motions are transferred ever inward toward the center, namely the Earth, and thus to the people. Yeah, that was the thought back then. And as a result, astronomy and astrology became conflated. Things are different nowadays. We don't believe in astrology anymore. We understand why the planets are in constant motion and that they have no influence on our actions. Astrology is the predecessor of modern astronomy. It originated in the Orient. In Mesopotamia, between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, priests and scholars were already recording the passage of the celestial bodies over 3,000 years ago. Ziggurats serve both as observatories and temples. From here, kings and priests ascended into the heavens in order to interpret and predict earthly events. As such, the stargazers and priest astronomer played a key role in politics and religion. For generations, the Babylonians painstakingly documented their observations on cuneiform tablets. In doing so, they noticed that all the planets moved in a plane, the elliptic. In the zone surrounding this line, the so-called zodiac, there are 12 constellations, the zodiac signs. Over the course of a year, all the planets traverse these zodiac signs, each on slightly different days of the year. These dates are key for astrology, but this is outside the realm of science. The natural sciences explain the behavior of things. We describe the behavior of falling apples, planets orbiting the sun or other stars. We describe the behavior of galaxies circling around each other. Science can't really investigate the origin of things, or what things actually are per se. Rather, we restrict ourselves to their behavior and development. Why that's the case, and why the laws of nature are the way they are, isn't so easy to answer, and not really a part of physics research either. Astrology is enjoying a resurgence in popularity. In our crisis-afflicted world, Astrology seems to offer a glimmer of hope. This fascination for the stars is being supported by a thriving esotericism industry. But if we stop trying to understand reality, we'll have a problem down the road. And I can imagine that these are all reasons why people fall prey to doubt. 
First doubting God and religion, then doubting science. And I believe that what people are searching for, namely certainty, doesn't exist in this world, because life is uncertain and will remain so, and science won't be able to give us absolute certainty about our prosperity. The roots of astrology date back over 3,000 years to when people started observing celestial phenomena as a kind of science. Back then, no distinction was made between astrology and astronomy. Then the ancient Greeks laid the foundations for separating astrology and astronomy. The faith-based interpretations of celestial phenomena are disputed by rational thought, freed of all things supernatural. I find it truly fascinating that we humans, with our small brains, they really aren't so big, and only have about 20 watts of power, are able to contemplate the entire universe and ponder where we come from and where we're going. I find it absolutely fascinating, and it shows what an amazing achievement evolution has done with us humans. But this brain of ours really should be applied to the right things, and that isn't always the case. The foundations of physics and astronomy laid in ancient Greece serve as the basis for modern-day astronomy. Roughly 2,000 years later, mathematician and astronomer Johannes Kepler took astronomy into a new age with his laws of planetary motion. But he's also a sought-after astrologist, too. Johannes Kepler is someone who, on the one hand, still conjured horoscopes. Apparently, he scored a few bullseyes, like with Wallenstein and the violent event that ultimately led to his death. On the other, he made it very clear that astronomy was like the poor mother of the wacky rich daughter astrology, meaning Kepler simply did it to make some money, knowing full well that it was nonsense. After all, he said that God had made him an astronomer, not a prophet. Kepler's theories were founded on mathematics. He sought to explain the world not through faith alone, but using the laws of nature with a dash of mysticism. That is the original scientific question. How does the world really work? And why is it the way it is and not otherwise? This is a really hard nut and one that cannot be cracked without scientific methods. And the reason why all cultures throughout the world created their own imaginative creation myths and worldviews. With many gods who could naturally do everything. But this came to an end roughly 800 before Christ. The natural philosophers of the time sat down and set away with all the gods. We want to understand the world just using logic. And we still refer to this big bang of understanding as the transition from mythos to logos. And it was a highly successful approach, because as methods of observation improved, so did our understanding of the world. The Church had adopted the geocentric model developed in antiquity, thereby adopting the ideas of the natural scientist Aristotle. This geocentric model, promoted 500 years later by the astronomer Ptolemy, doesn't contradict the Bible and is therefore compatible with the idea of the Christian God as the creator of the universe. A universe with the Earth at its center around which all the heavenly bodies orbit in perfect circles. Around 2,000 years after Aristotle, this picture changed. In 1543, Nicholas Copernicus moved the sun into the center of the universe. According to him, the Earth is a planet, which, like all the others, orbits the sun while rotating on its own axis. At the beginning of the 17th century, Galileo Galilei became the first person to use the recently invented telescope and observe how moons orbited Jupiter. So how can the Earth still be the center of all motion in the universe? This glimpse into space confirms to him that Copernicus's heliocentric model is correct. Galilei discards the constraints of the geocentric model 
and the church summons the scholar to appear before the Holy Inquisition. 20 years later, when he was condemned in 1632, he'd recently published his book, Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, the heliocentric and geocentric models. In it, he was certainly derisive of the Pope and the Aristotelian philosophers, and poked fun at the arguments of the Pope and the philosophers of the time, his philosophy professors, his colleagues, as it were. People read it and understood it to be a personal attack. And the irony is that when still a cardinal, Urban VIII maintained an amicable relationship with Galileo and actually encouraged him to pursue his scientific research. In his observations, Galileo Galilei described the lunar surface and the boundary between light and shade on the moon. His discoveries of the phases of Venus, sunspots, and the four moons of Jupiter support a planetary system orbiting around the Sun, thus confirming the Copernican model. Galilei's investigation of the visible cosmos is a threat to the Church's worldview. It involves Aristotle versus Copernicus and contradicting the Bible, something the Church is unwilling to accept. I don't think the confrontation between Galilei and the Church was a dispute between the Bible and science. Rather, I think it was a question of power, namely, who has dominion over interpreting the world. In the end, Galilei submits to the might of the papacy. The Church forces him to renounce his life's work and places him under house arrest until his death in 1642. Healing the split between the church and science takes a long time. Then in 1741, the Vatican under Pope Benedict XIV permits publication of the complete works of Galilei. The church has become humbler with time too. It used to cling very tightly to all these notions and not deviate even against its better judgment. You know what it's like when you're forced to admit to getting something wrong? It's an act that leaves you vulnerable and causes you to lose face publicly. Then in 1979, Pope John Paul II convened various theologians, scientists, and historians to finally put the Galilei affair to bed. Even within the church, his findings had been accepted as correct for centuries. The church has, I would say, wasted hundreds of years dealing with the simple question of whether the Earth orbits the Sun or vice versa, ultimately to reach the wrong conclusion. The Church had a big problem because it took too long to recognize that it was no longer a question of faith, but of knowledge. And after centuries, this finally caught up with the Church. The Copernican Revolution, that is, the rejection of a religiously informed worldview, not only marks the beginning of the modern age, but the loss of the Church's dominion over interpreting the world, and thus power. When it came to abolishing the index, that is, finally removing the books from the index, Catholic theologians and natural scientists were of the opinion that it was time to stop the Church being exposed to ridicule and finally fix the misjudgments of the past. Basically, the mistake they made back then was to conflate religion, power and natural science, or let's say rather fledgling natural science. It was only toward the end of the 20th century that the breakthrough in the Galilei affair was made. In 1992, John Paul II publicly acknowledged the achievements of the mathematician and astronomer Galileo Galilei and conceded that the Church had made mistakes. The world we live in today is shaped by modern science and space travel. Despite this, 
A long discarded worldview is experiencing a kind of resurrection. The flat earth. Of course the earth is flat. Just take a look around. Everything is flat. Or can you see anything that's curved? All cultures had this naive worldview in the beginning. But truth isn't determined by the majority. And that's something even the ancient Greeks realized. They discovered a logical error. If the earth is flat, What's stopping it from falling down? And it didn't take them long to come up with the right answer. It can only work if the Earth is a ball with everything falling toward the center. Among scholars, the concept of the Earth as a ball floating freely in space has been an accepted fact since antiquity. But until roughly 500 BC, many cultures believed in a flat Earth. The disk world, Carried by elephants and a turtle swimming through space is an anecdote that goes back to a series of novels by Terry Pratchett. But belief in a flat earth was prevalent in India and China, as well as the Germanic and the Babylonian cultures. The idea that during the Middle Ages, people thought that the earth was flat, with the ocean at the edge that ships drop over, is however a myth. It's a claim that only emerged in the 19th century and is still believed to this day. Even in ancient times, people noticed how ships disappeared over the horizon after around 10 kilometers, an indication and proof that the Earth is spherical. But in our enlightened world, the belief in a flat Earth is experiencing a renaissance. Nowadays, anyone can broadcast their personal theories to the entire world thanks to social media. In other words, there are a lot more potential explanations out there, with no indication as to whether they're good or bad, as no one filters them. So people are being bombarded with many more explanations, and everyone can just choose the one that appeals to them most. The flat earth hypothesis being embraced nowadays is the product of conspiracy theories that tend to be spread in esoteric circles. The discoveries in the fields of physics and astronomy of the past 3,000 years are dismissed as the lies of secretive power-hungry organizations. I think conspiracy theories and superstition are things that will be with us for the rest of human history. Superstition is often a consequence of our desire to take control of our lives. Even when everything goes wrong, being able to explain why it's happening or shielding ourselves from all possible dangers. And then we perform a ritual which makes everything okay. It's like manipulating reality. And it doesn't work. It didn't work in the past, and it won't work in the future either. Even the American amateur inventor Mike Hughes was convinced that the Earth was flat. The limo driver and former stuntman believed he was being lied to by science and the media who depicted the Earth as a sphere. What's happened is, um, what I discovered, what I researched for four to five, maybe six months, and I could not dismiss it, that the world, I believe, is honestly flat. It's probably like a Frisbee with turned up edges. In order to deliver proof for his supposition, Hughes wants to fly to space in a homemade rocket. After several failed attempts, Mad Mike launches toward Earth orbit in March 2018. His steam-powered rocket takes him to an altitude of around 570 meters during this test flight. An impressive achievement for a homemade rocket. And a demonstration of great personal courage. But the homemade rocket builder is still 100 vertical kilometers short of reaching the boundary to space. In February 2020, Hughes conducts another test flight with his homemade rocket. But the landing parachute fails. The rocket disintegrates on impact with the ground, and Mike Hughes is killed instantly. The globe is the symbol of a fraud of astronomical dimensions. 
This conspiracy theory isn't about faith or research, but a conscious denial of science. The church and science agree on one point. The universe came into being at one instant. There's disagreement as to what happened thereafter. The church says God created the world in six days, and he knew exactly how he wanted it to be. Science, on the other hand, says we can explain the evolution of the universe using just a handful of laws of nature. We can even confirm them experimentally, prove the facts. And the first person to do this back then was Galileo Galilei. So, do we have two valid ways of looking at the world? Not really. Because religion is based on pure faith. And science says we have demonstrable facts. Or as Bruno Jonas once put it, he who doesn't know has to believe. But in the final analysis, I don't think that religion and science are really that far apart. Because, as we've already seen, they have always been closely tied historically. For a long time, the Church claimed authority of interpretation over the heavens. Knowledge was preserved and passed down by priests and monks. Writings in Arabic and Greek were translated into Latin. And it was frequently men of religion that made new discoveries about our universe and described them. The calendar played an important role in this. Control over time was a source of power for religious and political leaders. The one who defines the calendar defines time and thus the course of life. And so the connection between the heavens, gods, and calendars is of utmost importance. Astronomy had always been important in the context of the calendar. For Christianity, the date of Easter is the date used to define the entire year. And the date of Easter, that is, the Sunday after the first full moon in spring, can only be determined astronomically. So it always has to be calculated, and this relies on very careful astronomical observations. Another aspect is that knowledge is obviously very important for faith, because knowledge reveals something about the creator of the universe. And when I know something about the world, it it brings me closer to God, the Creator. In order to deepen this knowledge, the Holy See established the Vatican Observatory in the 16th century. The Roman Catholic Research Institute is one of the oldest in modern astronomy. Traditionally, papal astrophysics has been conducted by Jesuits. Specula Vaticana. The Vatican Observatory also serves as a tool for strengthening ties between the Church and the scientific community. Nowhere are faith and knowledge more closely linked. Today, the research department of the Institute is based at the University of Arizona and works in one of the most modern centers for astronomy. The devout researchers have no problem with the worldview of modern physics. In the past, natural science was primarily advanced by members of the clergy and relatively pious people. Think of Copernicus, Kepler, Newton, Faraday, and many others, who basically considered their work as service to God. They were studying the beauty of nature in order to illustrate the greatness of God, as it were. The papal astronomers are acknowledged and respected scientists even if each new discovery in the depths of the universe seems to push their god a little further to the sidelines. If you say there is still a god and he's outside the universe, then he's outside the realm of physics too, because science is only concerned with explaining the universe and not with what else may possibly exist. With the dawn of manned spaceflight, humans have been literally ascending to heaven they were driven by their desire to discover and still are today. The view of the Earth from outer space reveals the true beauty of our planet, and also its vulnerability and isolation in the universe. Leaving our home planet and exploring ever deeper regions of space has not yet caused faith to be supplanted, nor religion to be damaged. 
Both being a scientist and religious is not contradictory, because if you push science far enough, you ultimately reach a point where you can't go any further. At some stage, you always end up at a point where you have to say, I can't explain it any further. And at this point, you can only wonder how it came to be. And that's where God comes in. Someone or something must have defined it to be so at some time. And you can attribute this definition to God. Or you could say it just came into existence. But I believe invoking God here is legitimate, which is why I believe that every scientist that delves deep enough into the science eventually arrives at this point. And it explains why there are a great many scientists who are very religious and don't consider it a contradiction. The frequent assertion that science will displace religion has yet to be substantiated. The idea that religion and science are in perpetual conflict is also a myth. Scientists are exploring our solar system, among other things, in search of extraterrestrial life. It's about understanding our origins. The search for God in our solar system, or in the depths of the universe, or even proof in the non-existence of God has no relevance here. It's neither the job of science, nor can it be. As such, faith is not compromised by the search for the holy grail of physics either. The search for the theory of everything, the theory that should precisely describe and tie together all known physical phenomena. Oh yes, the theory of everything. This is the belief that the entire universe should be explainable and predictable using one unified theory. But it's a delusion. A lot of people, including many scientists, believe in it. But it isn't going to work for two reasons. First, what does a theory of everything do? It takes some random state of the universe and calculates what will happen next. But to do this, you need to know the precise state of the universe, which means you'd somehow have to be able to measure the position of every atom in the entire universe. That's totally impossible. Second, we still have to account for quantum theory. And that says that on the smallest of scales, everything is a matter of chance. And this randomness propagates through to the macroscopic level. This means that contemporary science will never be able to calculate what tomorrow's lottery numbers will be, for example. It'll never happen. Even using astrology, our world is not predictable. What holds the universe together? This is the question researchers at the world's largest particle accelerator are seeking to answer. At the European research organization CERN, scientists are trying to understand how matter is created. In 2012, CERN researchers proved the existence of the so-called Higgs boson, the final gap in the standard model of particle physics. Its discovery is considered proof of the so-called Higgs field, which is responsible for giving the building blocks of matter their mass. This particle has the property of giving all the other particles their mass. So it's the key particle in telling the other particles how heavy they are. In other words, it's the basis for everything we see and feel around us. Now that they have proof that the Higgs particle exists, scientists are a step closer to understanding our universe. It's often referred to by the press as the God particle. The church repudiates the claim, saying God cannot be reduced to an elementary particle. The scientific community dismisses this description too. An author wanted to publish an article titled The Goddamned Particle in the sense that we can't find it. But the publisher said, no, we can't call it that, we'll have to call it The God Particle so we can publish it without anyone getting upset about the title. And so the term God Particle was born as the result of a publisher intervening in an author's choice of title. And it stuck. 
And like many things in physics, once it's out there, it never goes away again. The particle researchers want nothing less than to understand the structure of the universe. But as always, they're only just starting to. We've currently only discovered about 5% of the universe. This is the proportion made from normal energy and matter. The remaining 95% is still a big mystery. As such, a theory of everything that unifies all of physics remains a far-off dream for the time being. The search for a theory of everything is basically the search for a theoretical structure we can use to explain the world. This search, which may or may not be successful, this is science. And we don't know if it even exists. It's like looking for the holy grail of science. And once we have the result, we'll then look to see if it can be simplified even further. Is there another layer underneath the explanation, or are we really finished? If there really is no simpler explanatory level, which involves even fewer assumptions, we would have reached a point where we could say, we've done it, we can't go any further. At this point, we'd be able to directly observe the entity that created the world, as it were. A creator or a god is not absolutely necessary in modern cosmology. The basis for a complete understanding of the universe is provided solely by mathematics and physics. The scientific endeavor does not allow for theological arguments. Science's underlying principle is logic. Science cannot prove or disprove God because God isn't a legitimate scientific research project. Quite the contrary, God is categorically excluded. As a scientist, I need to take an objective approach. I seek to generalize and to reduce, and I use the language of mathematics. God is in a whole other category, and as such, God is not the object of scientific research. Proving the existence of the Higgs boson and thus the Higgs field represented a milestone in explaining our existence. But the findings of scientific research projects will never replace philosophical or theological interpretations of meaning. Scientists are probing even deeper into the microcosm in order to increase our understanding even of subatomic particles. Will this help us to understand the world better? No, not in the slightest, for two reasons. First, there's the principle of indeterminacy at the smallest scales, and this propagates into the macrocosm. When I roll dice, for example, I'll never be able to predict what the result will be. And then there's the phenomenon of emergence. This is the idea that the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Or as a physicist once said, more is just different. For example, biology and higher intelligence in particular cannot be deduced from the laws of physics. Biology is an independent science. Nature is innately random and complex, which is why there's still a lot of room left for the unexplained, and in particular, for a god. The theory of everything which describes the origin of life and the creation of the universe is just a scientific pipe dream. Albert Einstein's relativity theory is one of the pillars of modern physics. Einstein didn't believe in a personal God. For him, the word God meant the sum of all laws and systems from which the universe was formed and consists. When asked about his religious views, he responded, if something is in me which can be called religious, then it is the unbounded admiration for the structure of the world so far as our science can reveal it. <laughs>